Hi, and welcome to the Animal Training Academy podcast show, the show for animal training and behavior nerds, where I, Ryan Cartledge, interview the world's most proficient animal training and behavior geeks. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on whatever you're listening to this on so that you don't miss a single episode. Each episode of this show is brought to you on behalf of the ATA membership. And if you like the conversations in this episode, then you're invited to continue them with like-minded behavior nerds within the membership area, which you can find out more about at www.animaltrainingacademy.com. Once part of the ATA tribe, you'll get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help problem solve your training challenges. Plus, we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forum areas. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. But we will get started on today's episode where we will be talking to one Dr. Afia Fredericks. Dr. Fredericks is the Director of Professional Learning, Implementation and Research at Mindset Works. She was introduced to the growth mindset at the onset of her graduate school career where she studied the growth mindset throughout her master's and doctoral studies. Afia delivers talks and workshops for educators, leaders, and businesses. She is also an adjunct professor teaching research methods and statistics and psychology foundations to college students. There, she has been able to apply her work on mindsets and create a classroom environment and culture that embodies those beliefs. Dr. Fredericks truly believes that a growth mindset is more than just a concept that we want our students and colleagues to embody but a lifestyle that we should all strive to commit to. A St. Croix USVI native, Afia enjoys traveling home and taking in their magnificent views. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Dr. Afia Fredericks to the ATA podcast show today. Dr. Fredericks, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come and hang out with us at Animal Training Academy. Yes, thank you, Ryan, for having me. Um, it, I'm, I'm honored to have been invited to, to spend some time with you uh, and, uh, and your colleagues. So thank you. I'm super excited about this episode. And I've been wanting to create content on the growth mindset for a long time. Some of you in the podcast audience might have heard of the growth mindset before, and some of you, this might be the first time. I personally first heard about it in the work done by Carol Dweck, and the work that forms the backbone of the company that Affair works for, Mindset Works, which we'll hear more about soon. But I first heard about it on a marketing podcast about five years ago, and I then downloaded the audiobook, and it literally changed my life. It changed how I viewed myself and helped me understand others. And as I said, I've been wanting to create content on this for a long time, but I feel extra excited because of being able to record this episode in June 2020. One topic that is really occupying my thoughts at the moment is how to provide you, the podcast audience, with more tools, resources, and strategies to be effective ripple makers as we work to disseminate information about what we do and to become effective at working with everyone, including others who might have a different approach to behavior modification and training than you do. I believe to build our skill set at doing this, there is value in seeking conversations about what kind of mindset would best set us up for success. And there is no question in my mind that the growth mindset has a measurable value for our animal training community. So let's dive in and learn all about it. I feel I'm curious to learn a little bit more about you and how you came to be doing what you're doing. But before we do that, can we start off by you defining for the listeners of this show what the growth mindset is and why it's important? Absolutely. So when we talk about mindsets, we're talking about belief systems that we hold about the nature of our intelligence, our abilities, our personalities. And so growth mindset is the belief of our intelligence, abilities, personalities, uh, and other traits as malleable, right? Ones that can be developed and grown and, and, and through effective effort and strategies. And so 
uh, it's essentially a belief system, a lens in which we see things through. And uh, it's ex- extremely valuable because, you know, research has demonstrated that the belief systems that we hold impact and influence our behaviors, which in turn impacts and influences the outcomes or the results that may may occur as a result. So it is extremely, extremely important in regards to uh, the outcomes that that we see in our lives. And then also as we uh, interact with others, too, we can uh, support others being in that place of growth um, or that growth mindset or the alternative, which is the the fixed mindset. Uh, And I say alternative, but it's not necessarily a dichotomy in terms of how we experience it in the world. But for simplification. Uh, and and through research, we see it as you're either in that growth space or that fixed mindset, which alternatively is I either have it or I don't. You either have it or you don't. You were either born with it or you weren't. And that's all you have. Intelligence, uh, ability, personality, whatever you got is what you got. So that's the alternative. So yeah, I'll say that to begin. But, but it's more of a continuum. So you've got like fixed mindset and, and then growth mindset and then everyone somewhere on that continuum and can you the growth mindset is it as obvious as it sounds or is it obvious at all I don't know it seems like I can kind of put those two words together and kind of guess at what it means yeah yeah so with the growth mindset or mindsets it's definitely on on, on a continuum because the reality is we are toggling between mindsets daily momentarily Um, I like to call it complicatedly simple, right? To simplify it for others to understand, you see there's growth, there's fix, you believe you can grow, you don't believe you can grow, right? But the reality is it's very context specific. And so depending on what it is that, you know, you are, are, are doing or what challenges you're having in what areas, you might respond differently. And the beliefs that you may have uh, in one area might be different. Right. And so, for instance, the way you might respond to a challenge in, let's say, sports might not be the same way you respond to a challenge in math or English or reading and writing or, you know, interpersonal relationships or. And so definitely it, it, it's complicated in that we don't necessarily have one um, mindset that we operating 100 percent of the time. Uh, we are constantly toggling between that depending on the the context, the domain that we're interacting with. So it's very, you know, there's some complexity to it for sure. And, uh, and you're um, saying some trigger words for our audience when you say things like, like context. So, for example, uh, we might think about a dog barking. Um, a dog barking in the context of a home environment might be different to the context of a dog barking in a car, and they might have different functional purposes for that animal. Um, so is, is that, does that kind of relate to what you're saying? If we've got a different mindset on the sports field versus when we're learning maths, it's because of there's different reinforcers available and different learning history for individuals there and therefore we kind of think differently so absolutely so you're touching on i think multiple aspects right um so on one end i'm 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 hearing uh i'm hearing kind of insights on where they derive where do they come from how do we develop these mindsets right and then on another front i'm also hearing well what are the uh the what what type of environments possibly possibly might help to support one mindset or the other or, um, uh, you know, support the development of of our our mindsets, right? And so so on the one front, I'll start with the where it comes from. Uh, Really with our mindsets, it's it's about really the messages that we receive, you know, whether from our family members, parents, educators, the experiences that we've had. Uh, messages are always being sent, you know, to us, whether directly, indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, right? Uh, about the nature of our abilities and our intelligence, because. If I believe something to be malleable or not, I'm going to speak about it in a way that's going to imply that um, whether I'm conscious of what my beliefs are or and or if I'm conscious of how I'm I'm talking about or what messages I'm sending, that's another question. So 
for one, I think the, the the one thing that I think is probably more obvious to to some is the experience of of failures, right? Past failures being uh, something that could lead one to having a fixed mindset, right? This belief that this is who I am, this is where I am. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, and if you, you can think about that, you know, I haven't excelled at a particular subject or area. Uh, historically, and thus I'm more likely to believe that I can't, right? And you hear people say things like, I'm not a math person, I'm not a social person, I'm not a, you know, whatever the, the thing is. And that essentially is what that's that's getting at, right? My experience with this area, with this thing, then supports my belief of, well, I can't, or why even try? And see, that's the thing. When you have that belief of I can't and I'm not, and this is who I am, then you think about the behavior that follows. That behavior then is, so why bother? Why would I engage in the activities that are going to support my ability to grow in that thing if truly I don't believe that growth is possible? And so I believe those activities to then be futile. So I'm not going to engage in those activities. And thus the results, right, are more than likely going to be that you're not going to see the growth in those areas. So that's just also that connection between the beliefs that we hold and how that influences our behaviors and the outcomes that we might see. But also, I think one thing that we don't really think about as often in regards to where our mindsets might have uh, derived or um, what might help have, have had a support um, or form a fixed mindset in some areas is easy success. We overlook that, right? We overlook. And so for an example, you might think of the student who has excelled in whatever the area or areas are and haven't quite had to put in much work or effort into that. It's easy for that individual to believe that this is who I am. I am intelligent. I just, I'm a math person. That's just in me. And so if anything we know is that challenges, mistakes, failures, those are all inevitable and they're going to come. And so that's where you see that challenge where, you know, one might think, well, that's great that they believe that. But the problem with when you attach your abilities to something innate, something static, is that what happens with those challenges? And, you know, research has shown, um, you know, symptoms like depression to be more affiliated or associated with individuals that have more of that fixed mindset. Because imagine if you think this is all I've got, or you thought this was all you had, and it was, you know, this exorbitant amount, oh, so intelligent, so whatever it is, and now you're being challenged, the first thing you're likely to do is question you. Maybe I'm not smart enough, as smart as I thought I was, right? And so that really lends itself to some uh, some maladaptive experience or uh, uh, mental health challenges, possibly. So so that's that's the one end of it, right? In regards to well, where does it come from? The messages that we send, you know, you're not a math person or I know you're not an English person. Um, and I experienced that growing up um, in, in addition to the opposite. And I'll tell you a little bit about that a little later in terms of my mindset and how I develop um, the, my fixed mindset. So the next aspect you had touched on was our environment and how the conditions that we uh, operate in or navigate in can support. Well, if you think about, you know, rewards and punishments, for instance, right, if your product is only rewarded, right? You attaining some level of success, measurable success is the only thing that's rewarded. Then I might come to believe that that's more important than anything else. So then the question is, well, how do you get to that level of success? Isn't it not through hard work, effective strategies, time, practice, etc., making mistakes and learning from them, experiencing challenges and overcoming them? That's really, these are really the events that really support learning, right? And so I think what's really important is environments that support uh, and value and thus might more reward the growth 
and the process over simply the product. Because what we want to see more of is individuals really engaging in those behaviors that are going to support their growth. And over time, the hope is that they're able to accomplish or achieve and whatever, whatever that thing is and whatever that level is over time. Right. And so I think the messages that we send, how we reward, you know, certain types of behaviors or not what we choose not to reward as well. I think that sends a really important message and, um, there's studies that have have demonstrated. I know if one that comes off the top of my um, comes off my mind quickly is the Mueller and Dweck uh, study. Carol Dweck uh, and her colleague did a conducted a study where they looked at praise. Right, is all praise good praise uh, essentially? And what that study really demonstrated was the value of process praise over product praise, right? And and an example of product praise was um, telling students after they had succeeded uh, that they were so smart, right? So attaching, like praising an innate, some sense of innate um, uh, skill or intelligence versus process praise, which uh, was to say, wow, look at that score. You must have worked really hard at that. And then the study looked at the impact of how students were praised, right? In terms of then asking those students, would you like a harder problem when that, you know, you can learn from? And of course, about 92% of students who received process praise, they were like, yeah, sure. Yeah. Because if you give me more difficult problems, I can work hard because you just praised, right? You just demonstrated your value in my hard work, in my effort, in my process. I can do more of that. I can work, continue to work hard. I can continue to show up and 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 put in that time and effort. I can do that, right? Uh, versus uh, when you praise for these innate, you know, I, this innate sense of intelligence or ability, then the question then is, if I'm smart because I achieved highly, when I inevitably fall short, what am I then, right? If intelligence is simply just about the score, the product, inevitably in life, we're going to fail. We're going to experience challenges. We're going to make mistakes. Does that then mean that this fixed sense of whatever that quality was, I no longer have now? That was false. It was wrong. Right? And that's, I think, a, a big challenge. And, and what's interesting in that study, what the researchers found were that uh, when students at the end of that study had were asked about their you know their uh, accomplishments, students who received product praise uh, or intelligence praise were most likely to to lie about it. So again, if there's this fixed entity that I have, I need to hold on to that. I might lie, I might cheat, I might. Well, I gotta make that score. I gotta hit that you know that mark to demonstrate like this is the amount of, the, of whatever that quality is that I have. Right. And so um, there are a lot of detrimental uh, um, impacts that holding that fixed mindset, that belief of, you know, this is how much I have and communicating that through oftentimes not conscious ways of highlighting or, or you know, this um, these traits uh, rewarding, you know, traits, how smart someone is, how much of a people person someone is and and meaning or intending to do good. But in turn, you might put that person in this fixed sense of, oh my gosh, this is who I am. This is what I'm expected to do versus focusing on the process, right? Not that the product isn't important, but if we're going to talk about product, let's talk about how we got there. Let's talk about what we did to get there, the strategies that were used, right? Uh, The effective effort that was put in, the time that was spent, let's focus on that. And thus, let's show that that's valued. And so, you know, one of the best ways to demonstrate something is a value is to present a reward for those behaviors that we know will lead to growth uh, over time. And I would say also with growth mindset, you know, I remember being at a professional development talk and uh, a man asking me, well, th- does that mean that he can become a figure skater, a, you know, some something, a ballerina, it was just something like... 
okay, out there. And I said, well, that's a misconception. That growth mindset is saying that everyone is going to be an Einstein or everyone can achieve on, you know, whatever those levels are. Well, we know we're all starting off at different places and spaces. So what growth mindset is saying is that regardless of where we are, growth and improvement is possible. And so where you are today is not where you will always be. And where you are, where yesterday, you know, it, it does not then mean that there is no opportunity for us to grow. And so it's it's definitely relative. But the idea is that we can always improve. We can always grow. And we know it's through incremental growth and development that we, you know, achieve and we're able to accomplish whatever those goals are that we set out for ourselves. Awesome. And I'm going to uh, just disclaim what I'm going to be about to say. Well, my forms, my, my, my thoughts are racing right now and they're not probably very well articulated. So I'm going to try and uh, give you an example from our industry. Uh, and you can say, Ryan, were you even listening to what I was saying? <laughs> or, yeah, that, that's exactly <laughs> what I was talking about. So uh, something we sure. talk about uh, and, and I think is relevant to all, all people in all industries is imposter syndrome and Don, Donning Kruger effect. Um, and someone might... We might be online, we might be sharing our training videos. I'm guilty of this podcast audience, by the way, and we might share our greatly trained dog, um, but we don't show all of the mistakes that got us to that greatly trained dog. Um, and if if we have imposter syndrome and like, but I have, I'm Karen Pryor, training professional certified, you know, I've got this label attached to me, that's who I am. Who am I if... I show a video of me training my dog and it's all messy and all over the place. Um, and uh, my audience going to discover who I am. Um, so, and, and I feel like that's something that I, I experience, uh, even though I say that I've read the growth mindset and I'm creating content on the growth mindset and I'm inviting this conversation. Like I'm not definitely, uh, depending on the context, as we talked about earlier, uh, experiencing that and being able to, um, have that mindset in all contexts. Uh, is, is that a relevant kind of <laughs> industry absolutely, example? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think it's awesome. Um, the level of awareness that the question just demonstrated, like you being aware of uh, the actions that you may take sometimes and how that could speak to, you know, one mindset versus the other and, and how you feel, right? Um, and I think that's really the first step to really beginning to transform and, and grow um, in terms of our growth mindset and then also deepen the growth mindset that we may, you know, we may, may have already. Um, so awareness is really important and I always say that with mindsets we're talking about adding a essentially a layer of consciousness to what we do right it's like what are we doing and and being conscious of the messages that we're sending and you know the intention behind what we're doing and why so that was really a, a great a great question I would say that especially I think in today's world it's really difficult um, to I think to 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 be open and vulnerable with the challenges that we're experiencing and mistakes. And and I just just thinking of like, let's say social media, for example, like how many pictures does one take before they post? And then even before one posts, how many filters are applied? <laughs> or, you know, or not, but I'm sure that wasn't the first take, <laughs> you know, think about and, you know, and so we're, we're in this society where it, it almost feels like it's like perfection, right? Or, um, you know, at least hiding to some extent, the imperfections is, is necessary, not valued or kind of frowned upon. And so I think also be aware of the type of society that we might be, um, uh, operating in as well and why there might be discomfort around kind of demonstrating and, and, and being open about that. But I think it's really important because what you might be doing then is triggering other people's fixed mindsets and possibly putting them into that space where I can't demonstrate my work or talk about my work unless it's perfect or I can't show, you know, any signs of challenge or, and so sometimes I think we don't realize that we might in turn be um, uh, sending a message that we don't necessarily intend. And I think a, a great example for me is like just thinking about being in the classroom I know myself as a uh, adjunct professor, 
especially in research methods and statistics with psychology majors, the minute they walk into my class, many students, they're just like, the walls are already up, right? It's like, oh no, I've never done well in math. I have always struggled. It's like, you know, and I think for me, I realized that students really believe that I was pushed out the womb uh, computing statistical problems. Like, oh, Dr. Fredericks, you, you know, you got this, you, and I, Part of, I feel like my duty as an instructor, as a a professor, um, is to be clear and let them know and be transparent about my struggle, right? Because I recognize where they are and I want them to see that the only difference between themselves and me, right, is the, the, the years of work and the challenges and the mistakes and the failures and the, so I'm very transparent about my struggles with statistics. And, you know, it takes some time before they really believe what I'm saying, but I have to demonstrate, I have to share, you know, and to a large extent be vulnerable with them because I want them to see themselves in me. And so it's important. And then what I'm also saying is, are you experiencing challenge? Are you struggling? Oh, well, that's great. Because I also had to do that to get to where I am. So it's almost like you're on the right track. If you're struggling, if you, and and some people may not be struggling as much, right? But for those who are, and they'll probably continue to excel. uh, But for those who are, I want them to know that this is a part of the learning process. And that's a big component of growth mindset. It's the learning from the challenges, the mistakes, the failure. Growth mindset really allows us to look at those things as opportunities. And and it sounds great and, and it's definitely not as easy as it sounds, I'll tell you that. But that's really a core component of growth mindset. Neuroscience supports that. There's neuroscience that demonstrates that individuals with the growth mindset, physiologically, their brains respond differently when they make mistakes. And the response or the attention paid to mistakes then leads to future, uh, you know, future achievement in regards to those very same types of problems, then being able to then get them correct in the future because the mistakes were made and they attended to them. So if you think about the science, the neuroscience of learning, mistakes are a very important uh, uh, catalyst to our growth and our development. And so oftentimes we're fighting against emotions like judgment, shame, fear, guilt, right? And so that's very natural and normal to feel those ways. Uh, But if we think about it in terms of opportunities, and I have a colleague, Jen Machen, and Jen Machen always poses this question and she's like, what are you going to do about it? Okay, you're encountering this challenge. You just made a mistake. What are you going to do about it? And I think with growth mindset, right? It, it, there's un- essentially what growth mindset is saying is, do you believe in neuroplasticity? Because science has already stated that this is a fact. Do you believe in it? And do you believe in your ability to influence and impact your reality through the power of neuroplasticity? Right. And I was talking to another colleague of mine, Dr. Kendra Coates. And as through our well, through our conversation, that's what we 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 came to, because we always grapple with the nuances of growth mindset all the time. And and I and, and I said, wait a minute, what are we really saying then? And she said, Afia, do you believe in science? That's what the question is. <laughs> that's what Kendra said. She's like, there's that's not debatable. That's real. We know that it's possible for us to grow and develop. We know the benefits of challenges and mistakes to our, you know, neurologically, right? Because when we're talking about growth, when we're talking about improvement, when we're talking about learning, what we're talking about typically is one of three things. It's either the 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 building of neural pathways, the strengthening of those neural pathways, or the generating of neurons. Right. This is a scientific fact. So the question is, do we believe in it? And if we do, then um, that allows. And, and so if we believe in it, then it's also that agency piece. Well, you have the ability to take control of that process and use it for you if you choose to do so. And the belief that we have, if we believe in that and we believe that it's true for us, then we're more likely to do something about it, a.k.a. uh, or also known as or, you know, uh, engaging in learning zone activities. 
when we talk about the learning zone, we're talking about deliberately focusing on improving and growing and learning. And so engaging in those activities and the CEO of, of Mindset Works, Eduardo Brasino, he talks about this. Uh, he talks about deliberate practice and the importance of it. Right. I think it's Eric Anders that uh, he wrote Peak, you know, the psychology of success. And it's not just about the time that you put into something. It's about the quality of that time, deliberate practice. And I love to give the example of like how often people type, right? Do you type daily? Do you type weekly? Right. And you think about that. And I say, well, how much better at typing are you today than you were a week ago, a month ago? And people are like, huh? Yeah, not much, but you do it every day, right? So it's like, well, I'm doing it, you know, I put time into this thing and it's like, right, but it's not about the literal, I'm just putting time into something. I'm just doing something repetitively, right? Are we focusing on specific subset of skills? Are we focused on improving certain areas, right? And so when we think about what we can do about it, it's also about being strategic about those things. And we don't always know how to specifically improve something. And if you think about typing, it might be purchasing a program or a software, right? Um, to support us through that. It might be talking to someone uh, like yourself, Ryan, who might excel in certain areas, right? And it's like, well, what are, what are you doing? Because maybe I can learn from, from what you do, what you're doing or what you did, or maybe you've had that struggle or that challenge and these specific strategies supported your learning and your growth, right? And so it's really about the time that we spend and the deliberate act of working and targeting a subset of skills uh, and engaging in the activities that are going to support that growth in those areas as well. So that I know you asked one question, but um, <laughs> those are all the things that, you know, it invoked. <laughs> hey, hey, you know, this, this is one of those podcasts where I wish people could see your face when you said, do you believe in neuroplasticity? <laughs> it's just pointing at the screen and a massive smile on your face. <laughs> Hopefully they can hear it in my voice. <laughs> And hey, you said you wanted just to riff on this podcast, and I know I sent you an outline, but uh, uh, if we never get to any of the questions we send to the outline, I apologize for that. We call it passion talking. Normally I say passion talking is defined by the person saying, what was the question again? In your case, maybe. I know you asked one question or your face when you said, do you believe in neuroplasticity? I like that you brought up vulnerability because I'd written uh, that down. Uh, we've, it's, a, it's a word. I've been listening to Brene Brown on Netflix. It's a word that uh, we've been talking about on the podcast today. And the vulnerability and courage uh, being inseparable and in, in us within our membership at Animal Training Academy, we try to celebrate courage and, and the sharing of uh, training videos in our community and being vulnerable in that space. And, and I find it so interesting. We talked about context before. I'm, I'm just jumping back to notes I've made and, and it's kind of like picking up little pieces throughout the conversation. Um, we and, and and just want to work on this a little bit more, and, and maybe you can offer some tips here. I feel I feel one. Uh, there's so many challenges that we have as as humans, <laughs> and that are um, you know ones that share similarities of all industries and we've got our own specific examples of an animal training industry. But we're we're very good, I believe, at, at teaching. <laughs> Because we have animals in front of us and we teach them and we ignore mistakes and we celebrate success um, and then we shape little tiny baby steps towards the behaviours we want and we get there in the end and we have these videos of these animals doing these amazing things, you know, lying there for 20 seconds while we inject them in a, a lion with a needle into its tail and it doesn't flinch and then it gets up calmly and comes with us and does the next behaviour. Um, but then we have to take that same skill set into a different context. Uh, and that is with humans. Uh, and, and suddenly we we, uh, we find the context means that our behaviour doesn't potentially not share similarities with uh, our behaviour when we're in the line. Um, so what what are, do you have any thoughts on that and slash to build on what you've already said, to repeat what you've already said or to add new information, um, how our audience can better understand that? Cause I, and I'm going to stop talking soon and hand it over to you and, 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 and to add to that and for you to inject some more information. Uh, I, I feel if my thoughts are in your reflection of the podcast audience and some people might be going, holy crap, I can see this in myself, or they might be going, holy crap, I can see that in the people I work with, or both. 
Um, so I'm interested to know your thoughts on all of that, <laughs> and, <laughs> and 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 in your own journey as well. Like, what what was it? Did you come into the growth mindset and go? I'm just going to like try to figure out what I want to do with my life. And you start reading about the graph mindset. You're like, oh my God, that's me. Like I need to change my mindset. Or were you like, oh my God, like I can see how this can help people. I want to go help people or both. That wasn't wow. one question. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's a lot. Okay. Okay. A lot of ideas are, and thoughts are coming up for me. I think for one, you mentioned like transferring how we, you know, work with uh, or how we might interact with, with animals and then humans. I think for one, I think when you think about, let's say an animal, and I, I, I will just put this disclaimer out there. I do not, you know, I'm not necessarily aware of the realm, you know, of this, this, this world that sounds super amazing. Uh, and I've, in the past, I've, I've owned a, a cat and, and dogs, you know, Rottweilers. They're the most precious, large beings. I love them. But, you, just um, won, you just won the hearts of a, a, a segment of our podcast audience. But, yeah! You know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I love smaller dogs as well, but big dogs are just like, oh, there's just a strength. But then it's like, I mean, there's just, I just remember, I, I just can remember being younger and my my Rottweiler, uh, Mufasa, like wobbling over and putting his whole 90 pound self on top of me. Like, <laughs> you know, they are massive creatures, but oh, they're just, they're sweet. And so... So, you know, I don't have an extensive experience, but I love um, I love animals and, and I love Rottweilers for sure. Uh, but when you think about when I think about it, it's I remember, you know, um, you know, Mufasa as a as a pup. Right. And so being able to, you know, from essentially day one or somewhere close to day one, uh, being able to provide and support and, you know, be uh, in charge of what type of nutrition and the environment and, and training from that young. And obviously, you know, with the human beings, um, unless we're talking about our children, right? Uh, which there's, you know, there's, uh, there's definitely implications for parenting there, um, for sure. But, you know, we're a little more complex in certain ways right because you know the people that you encounter on a day-to-day -day, they have a history they have a story they have experiences they have successes they have failures and all of this baggage right and baggage doesn't necessarily mean bad right because we could have a lot of awesome stuff in our luggage you know <laughs> But some some unnecessary stuff or not unnecessary because we cannot use everything, I think, um, for our growth and our, our learning. But there's a lot of different things that can come in, you know, come with us. And so I think that kind of makes it complicated because those experiences are definitely influencing the behaviors that you're seeing and, and driving, um, you know, our our want or, or experiences and, and what we do and choose not to do. And so my colleague, so Dr. Dr. Kendra Coates, she talks a lot about like neural pathways. And she was like, as much as we can build and develop healthy ones, we can also build and develop unhealthy neural pathways as well. And so over time, that becomes kind of the norm, whether it's what we do, how we respond to things or what we say. If we built some strong neural pathways that are aligned with that fixed mindset, then it's going to take a lot of deliberate work and consciousness, you know, being aware uh, to really begin to to undo or unlearn some of those behaviors. Right. So, you know, which can definitely be be a, a difficult process and and what's interesting is I had participated in a book study it was a mindset book study yesterday and there was a neuroscientist on deck and she talked about the neuroscience in terms of changing you know mindsets and the neuroscience underpinning like reframing and you know you hear you hear different statements like we're not stuck at home, we're safe at home, right? Or, you know, this isn't happening to me, it's happening for me, right? For my growth, my development, my, and, you know, I know we've heard things like that and we're like, oh yeah, that sounds nice or whatever, right? This reframing thing. 
But there's neuroscience to support that because we think about the hormones that we are inducing when we transform the way we think about things, right? Uh, my colleague Kendra, she she and her her children, they'll have this thing where it's like mom, you, mom needs serotonin, serotonin, and that means come in for a hug, come in for a big one, mom. Let's go. You know, because as you're engaging in, you know, a hug or you're thinking about, you know, what you're grateful for, you are literally inducing, you know, a physiological response in your body, right? Which is connected to the hormones. And and so we think about learning and unlearning behaviors, et cetera. Like it's really important for us to be mindful of the the power of, you know, our, you know, neuroscience and, and physiology and biology and hormones uh, in that. So just went off on that on that tangent. But in regards to, let me see, the support. Okay, so supporting others. So I think, you know, like for one, supporting our, our children as parents, it's going to look a little different than supporting our colleagues uh, or supporting those who we maybe directly supervise. But I think there are things that are, you know, very similar in terms of the language that we use and what we choose to highlight and pay attention to. And for me, as a parent, that's something that I struggle with because it's easier for me to do what was done to me. Right. And so it's difficult now with additional knowledge and consciousness to now operate in a way that I haven't necessarily seen been done or wasn't necessarily done to and for me. And so now it takes a little more. And I can see the same thing for educators or, you know, anyone in any field where they're teaching and and, and working with others. Right. You're more likely to lead in ways that you have been led or that you've seen. Right. And maybe you've seen very helpful healthy ways and maybe you've seen maladaptive ways and whatever those er ways are those experiences are you're more likely to duplicate them because they're going to come easier and more natural to you and so I think it takes a real you know level of consciousness to to continually question wait a minute what am I doing what is the intention behind this does this support this idea and notion that we can grow, we can develop, right? Or in our language with our children, in our, in our language with our colleagues, did I just make a statement that might imply that you are innately one way or the other? And, and I think it's this like process, right? I like to think of growth mindset as this lifelong journey, this constant process of, of questioning and, and wondering and thinking and, and just being aware of, of what we're doing and the intention behind it. And, and knowing that the mistakes that we might make, the failures that might occur are really important too, if not more important to our learning and our growth and our development. So I think for one, the language is kind of the main thing in terms of communicating and then also and so with language I'm saying there's there's two parts I think for me especially with my my son it's the highlighting the neuroscience behind it right because again to go back to what I said previously do you believe in neuroplasticity because it's true right and so that being able to teach him like honestly he has like some stuff neurons and a stuffed brain, I mean, thanks to my colleagues, because they're like amazing, <laughs> Kendra and Jen, right? So my two-year-old, if I if he saw a picture of a neuron, 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 like he, like, hey, get neuron, buddy. Oh, get your brain, you know? And so from very young, we're having these conversations. He's very much aware, right? And so I'm gonna build on that, right? When he's struggling, oh my goodness, I, ah, oh man, I like, for me, that's opportunity, that's an opportunity. Is it hard? Are you struggling? Like, I like to ask him so that we can we can confirm that it is hard. It is struggling. Just in case he missed it. <laughs> like I just caught that. You're struggling. And so I, I use those as opportunities to say, you're learning. Oh my gosh. Like, how do we begin to reshape the narrative around challenges and failures to, you know, not being one of like doom or like avoid it, abort, abort, avoid it at all costs. Like, no, like, oh my goodness, you need the challenge to grow and learn. That means you're about to learn something, you know? And so I'm consciously trying to reframe those uh, those experiences for him. And so the goal is that as he goes through life, he's not running away from challenges or cowering when something is difficult. 
You know, I want him to be curious. I want him to 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 take that challenge on. Not that it's going to be easy, but for him to embrace that, right? And so I think there are ways in terms of the language that we use, uh, how we respond to situations and scenarios that directly demonstrate how we feel about those things. Whether we view someone engaging in a challenge or struggling with something as, oh, you're not any good at that or, oh, no, right? It, not just the words, but how we, you know, the energy energy that we give off, like all of that can communicate to someone, you know, I think your level of ability in that thing is low because you are struggling. Right. And so thinking about our beliefs, we're going to respond differently depending on what we believe. Because if I believe you can grow and I believe you can learn and I believe mistakes are important, you know, an important uh, catalyst for that, then I'm more likely to provide you with resources. I'm more likely to make recommendations and suggestions to you. I'm more likely to support you through those challenges, those those mistakes and those failures. Right. And so that's something also to be conscious of that, you know, we we respond to things and people in ways that really demonstrate those underlying beliefs that we may have, whether it's about a person, right? I might believe you can grow, but I don't quite believe you can, right? And so I think for us to be aware of the messages that we're sending, how we respond, especially when people are challenged and, and, and going through, you know, a setback or failures, I think those are those real, I think, opportunities to, 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 to demonstrate our belief in the malleability of individuals, their intellectual abilities, and, you know, whether it's personality or just skills and abilities in any, any, you know, area um, that they might experience. So that's, that's, the next thing. And then I think the last thing I, I, you asked about my journey as well, but did you have any questions before that? Cause I, I definitely know, you know my journey. I can talk about that, but did you have any questions? Um, just, just acknowledgement that? there when I'm talking and, and rocking our 11 week old baby summer, uh, I'm like, man, you sound just like your mom, right? <laughs> <laughs> and that's not a bad thing at all. I'm just saying it. I'm so conscious of like how much I sound like my mum, just in the, the tonality and in the voice. And I mean, I can't remember being a baby, but I've, I've observed her with my nephews. Um, anyway, no, no, no more questions. I'm going to let you continue to riff. Okay. Okay. Got you. Oh, and I will say too, um, about that I think like that level of awareness is is great because I think you know when we're not aware we're more than likely going to repeat behaviors good bad and indifferent and so the more that we're aware because you know ideally we're trying to improve upon you know the who we were in the past that should be the competition right to be better than we were before versus you know someone else like how do I consistently improve and be better uh but I think that you know just being aware of you know like in that example like what did our parents you know do and what were those positive areas that we want to continue and what were some of those other areas that hmm, I might do this a little differently right because if we're not conscious about those things then and, and it could be it could be a mentor right it might not be a parent it might be a mentor someone that you look up to someone that you're like I love how you do this and well but not so much that and I think being conscious and aware of that and having those you know those moments of reflection allow us to continue like take you know they say don't throw out the baby in the bathwater. yeah yeah okay so like that right <laughs> take what you take what you see as valuable but then also kind of learn from those areas that might not be as adaptive for you and 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 make that your own but I think it's only through consciousness and awareness and reflection I think that's an important aspect too when we we talk about mindsets and growth right if we're not taking time to reflect on what we're doing and is it working are we getting the results that we're hoping for so this is not mindless you know doing like I'm just chugging along here I'm just working 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 well are you seeing improvement are you seeing growth because if you're not then maybe you might want to restructure or change those strategies Strategies, you know, maybe it's not working in the way that you would have hoped for, but maybe there are other strategies and other uh, ways that can support the results and the outcomes that you want to see. So I just want to put that out there that growth mindset is not saying just work, just keep on working. Doesn't matter what the results are. That's not the case. Like, that's not what that is. I think that's what Carol Dweck would call a false growth mindset. <laughs> so my journey. Oh, my journey. 
So I think when I start and think about my growth mindset journey, I, I just think about um, like grade school, right? So I remember, so sixth grade, and I, I grew up, so I was born and raised in St. Croix, United States, Virgin Islands. And so sixth grade, we had a promotional exercise and eighth grade, right? We also had a promotional exercise there. So that's like the end of elementary and the end of middle school for us. And for both of those, I I held the honor of valedictorian. And so that's like the highest honors for, you know, out of the entire class. And so throughout my entire childhood, I can't tell you how many times I heard about how smart I was. That was the thing. You're so smart. You're so smart. You're so smart. It's like you get it from your teachers, from your parents, from your friends, from your friends' parents, from your teachers' friends. I mean, it was just this this thing. And I remember when people said that, I would say, no, 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 no. It's not that I'm smart. It's that I work really hard. Because I truly felt like an imposter. I felt like the people who were truly intelligent were the ones who just showed up and they could hear a lesson once and they got it. That's it. And I wasn't that because lucky for me, or at that time, unlucky, right? That's what I thought. Uh, I had a mother who was an educator. She's a middle school social science teacher. And so with her, it was... No, you are not going to watch TV during the week. You are going to get some work done. Weekends, you can watch TV. Uh, Also, (laughs) if she asked if there was homework and I was like, well, no, we didn't have any homework. She's like, yes, you did have homework because you took notes in class, didn't you? Thus, you need to go review them notes. Like you have homework, go do it, right? And so (laughs) I had this very (laughs) militant, like very strict mother that made sure I did the, you know, the engage in the activities that were necessary for me to learn and grow. And and I saw the fruits of all of that labor. Unfortunately for me, though, I didn't, I saw my effort and the work that I put in as a sign of my lack. I thought, man, if there's anything that demonstrates how not intelligent I am, it's how hard I have to work, right? Which now I know it's like, that's like... <laughs> such, you know, that fixed mindset right there, right? Uh, And so I think there's also a misconception that for high achievers, this isn't applicable. Um, I would beg, no, it is because I had that imposter syndrome for so long. And so by the time I got to high school and I probably failed like my first assignment, right? Like, oh my goodness, the world, the walls were just crumbling like and falling, caving in and falling apart. I was a mess. And I remember um, that first semester and at that time they would put all the grades up on the wall of the the principal or the, the main office and they would line it up by like GPA order. And people would be looking at the top like, I feel yeah, where are you? I don't see your name. And I remember that first time I said, listen, listen, I was valedictorian for sixth grade and I was valedictorian for eighth grade. I'm going to give somebody else a chance. Okay. Like, and that was it. And I felt comfortable playing small. It's like, nah, I can't do this. And I, I, I mean, I gave up, meaning I was more of like a B student versus the A student that I could have been, but it was too much weight. I was tired of playing this imposter. I was tired of, you know, being something I wasn't. That's kind of how I felt. So what happened is that's kind of the plateau, right? You know, people talk about, oh, you're just a natural this and you're, well, without the hard work, without, guess what? You're going to limit how much you can, you know, what you can accomplish without that, without, you know, working through the challenges and and pushing yourself, you know, a plateau is going to happen. And so, you know, I I, I plateaued and and I remember, you know, undergrad, you know, I just kind of yeah, and I coasted on through and yeah, you know, and, and I remember math was a big struggle for me because like in school, I would have questions. I wouldn't dare raise my hand. Right. Because, oh, my goodness, if my colleagues only knew how much of an imposter I was. So I would wait till after after class, after school. And I would go to my teachers and I would have a list of questions, <laughs> you know, so just hiding, constant hiding. And so, you know, I went to undergrad and, you know, I, you know, I just kind of 
did my thing and coasted along, right? And again, like my coast just happened to be, you know, decent. I think I had like a 3.6, just, you know, like coasting. I worked hard, granted, but I kind of just was like, you know, I'm not a smart person. This is just who I am. I'm just going to do what I need to do. And, you know, that's that. Uh, so what I was taught and those values of, of working hard and studying, I kept doing those things. Right. Um, and so I was able to achieve and accomplish. And it was only until I it was only when I got to graduate school, I attended Howard University. Uh, and I guess I should mention the University of the Virgin Islands. Yeah, that was the, my undergrad institution. Uh, so when I say born and raised, it's like born, raised and then four years of undergrad. Right. <laughs> significant. I think I've lived in the Virgin Islands still longer than I've lived in the U.S. mainland, right? Uh, So it was only when I came to Howard uh, for grad school that I found that first article. It was Blackwell, Dweck, and Twiz... Uh, Kali, that's her first name. I don't want to mispronounce the last name, but I found that first article uh, on growth mindset. It was a 2007 article, I believe. And that was it. I was like, where was this when I was struggling and feeling like an imposter? And this was like, I could have accomplished and achieved so much more had I even understood this. I was just like, oh gosh. And I think about like my mom and she, I mean, (laughs) bless her soul. She tried. I remember her telling me, you know, don't worry. I wasn't a math person either. I was like, oh, gosh, that's like quintessential fixed mindset message right there. Like, you can give up, honey. It's okay. We're not math people, you know. Like, and she said it with really good intent. She saw her baby suffering and she was trying to support and comfort me, not realizing what she was actually communicating to me, right? And that's another thing that, again, that intention, intentionality, that being aware and conscious of what we're saying and what we're communicating, right? So she knows now, but, um, you know, I remember thinking, man, this, this is, this was, this is my problem. This was my problem, right? And some people would be like, did you really have a problem? I mean, you did pretty good. (laughs) You know, if you ask me, like, what was the problem? But it was just for me knowing that I could have accomplished so much more and I got in my own way. It was me. It was my beliefs about what intelligence meant and what struggle meant and what working hard meant to me. All of that was just like, you're not supposed to struggle if you're truly intelligent. You're not supposed to have to work hard if you're truly intelligent, right? And so it was that article that really... um open my eyes. And and that's when I realized, man, this would have been so valuable if I had that, you know, as a, a child, if my parents had that, if they knew about it. And, and I'll tell you, they had no idea what was happening in my mind, right? Granted, like they didn't know what I thought about being intelligent and smart. I just thought they were torturing me, you know, just like, do I really have to get this work done? Yes. You know, I, I just, they didn't know. I wasn't aware. So I, I just at that point said, like this, this is it. Like there was this thing that resonated within me. And I knew that was the work that I wanted to to continue. And I knew that was the, the message that I wanted to put out into the world. And I wanted to work on consistently or constantly, you know, really deepening and strengthening my growth mindset, sharing that with others and supporting others, whether educators or, you know, colleagues or, you know, business people, whomever, uh, anyone and everyone in, you know, just spreading that, that, that message and and the knowledge and the understanding and sharing it. Uh, I think it's really important. And that was essentially when I fell in love with that and haven't turned back since. So still doing the work. Hey, thanks so much for sharing all of that affair. The podcast audience, me and Afia, have just had a little bit of chat that, you, that you, you're not privy to because it's off, off air for the for the recording. But we want to keep picking Afia's brain because this is super interesting uh, and uh, I'm, I'm having a ton of fun, so it's purely a selfish endeavor. But we, we thought that the length of this podcast might mean that it's better to split into two episodes. So what we're going to do actually right now is we're going to end this recording and we're going to welcome you back in two weeks from the release date of this episode to carry on the conversation. Uh, before we do, though, I, I feel for those who have listened up until this point and are curious, and I know that you've been promoting curiosity in this episode, uh, and our podcast audience are a curious bunch and they want to learn more, where can they 
they go to learn more about the stuff you've been talking about today and, and the company Mindset Works that you work for? Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so Mindset Works. So our main website, it's mindsetworks.com. And so M-I-N-Z-S-E-T-W-O-R-K-S, mindsetworks.com. You can find us on Instagram and that's at mindset underscore works. And be mindful that the works is plural. So it's an S at the end uh, on Facebook at Mindset Works. One word, uh, Twitter at Mindset Works and LinkedIn, same at Mindset Works. And so you can find us on any of those social media platforms. And of course, uh, on MindsetWorks.com. And we'll link to all of that in the show notes as well. I've spent quite a bit of time on the Mindset Works website. Uh, your mission, I'll, I'll read your mission out quickly so the audience uh, understands a little bit about it. Mindset Works is the global leader in growth mindset development, leveraging the pioneering research of Carol Dweck and Lisa Blackwell. The company's mission is to enable a world in which all people realize continual learning and growth. The diverse Mindset Work teams includes practitioners, coaches, leaders, and researchers who collaborate to translate academic academic research into products and services that nurture positive learning beliefs, habits, and cultures. If you're listening to this show and you're not curious to go check out that website, <laughs> then I don't know what to say. <laughs> I'm sold. That's awesome. Um, we'll link to all of that in the show notes. We're going to continue this discussion in two weeks' time, everyone. Uh, before we do, though, uh, Dr. Fredericks, thank you so much. I know your son uh, has <laughs> woken just before we started recording and um, you've been uh, able to to navigate the space and, and allow the, the recording to continue but we're going to allow you to <laughs> go be your mum and, and play your other roles in your life but for spending time with us here at animal training academy today we are grateful thank you so much thank you it was my pleasure i appreciate it and i hope you know something and this one thing from uh what i uh, talked about discussed or said today could be uh beneficial to the lives of of many and i hope you you leave with a feeling of hope and an endless possibilities and unlimited potential because this is what that work fosters in in myself and i want to share that with the world so thank you ryan for having me We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and you were interested in carrying on the conversation about working with our animals in the most positive, funnest, choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.animaltrainingacademy.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. There's something there for absolutely everyone and we're looking forward to having you join the tribe. That's it for this episode though. We're going to wrap it up there. Thanks again so much everyone for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.